what do you get when you combine the pinnacle of modern metallurgy with the ancient traditions of Japan? An L6 katana made by Howard Clark paired with both modern and antique fittings is a good way to find out. Hello, this is Kyle, also known as Alien Tune, and today I am reviewing a very special sword. This is worth more than any five swords in my collection combined. It's a Howard Clark L6 katana on loan to me by my extraordinarily generous friend, Steve. If you're not familiar with the name Howard Clark, he's a pioneer in the field of bladesmithing with a focus on scientific analysis of metal composition and heat treatment. Over his extensive 30 plus years as a bladesmith, Mr. Clark has pretty much perfected the modern katana blade made from L6. So L6, what's the big deal? Keeping in mind that I'm not a metallurgist, I'll give you a brief rundown of what I've gathered. Normally when a steel blade is quenched, the crystalline structure of the steel is in the form of martensite. This structure produces high hardness and quite a degree of brittleness. The temper process after the quench then gently lowers the hardness a little, while considerably reducing the brittleness. In contrast to that, Mr. Clark's very specific and difficult heat treatment process produces a bainite structure. Bainite is both very hard and extremely tough, leading to swords that hold an edge for a long time while also being resistant to chipping. In addition, they're able to flex well when bent. I've included a link in the description to a video of Mr. Clark's destruction tests on one of his L6 bainite katana, so you can see just how impressive they are. Now you don't have to go very far to find katana available online that are made from L6, but that's not really a big deal because L6 is not by itself anything special. The important part is the incredibly complex and difficult heat treatment process that Howard Clark has developed. It's that heat treatment process that creates the exceptionally strong and tough swords that Mr. Clark is known for. Without it, L6 is not much different than any other sword steel with uh, comparable carbon content, such as 1070. To give you an idea of just how difficult the heat treatment is, Mr. Clark made a total of three blades for this order. The first two cracked during heat treatment. This is a big part of the reason that Mr. Clark's L6 bare blades start at 5,000 US dollars. So if you see a non-Howard Clark katana advertised as being made from L6, chances are pretty good that it's not going to have gone through the correct heat treatment to form bainite. I believe Hanway had some success in this regard before their factory fire, but that's mostly based on my hazy recollections and hearsay. Now let's talk about the design and history of this sword, as it's pretty interesting, to me at least. Steve commissioned this and a matching Wakazashi blade as dedicated cutting swords. That wakizashi was never mounted, but this katana was sent to Ted Tennolds to do the mounting. Steve's sensei helped him source the antique Suba and Minuki, and the rest of the Koshirai were created by Patrick Hastings. Steve's concept for this sword was to marry the absolute best technology in a blade with traditional fittings to marry old and new into one harmonious whole. Steve intended this sword to be his primary cutter, and he estimates it's been used on several thousand used tatami mats. He loaned it to his classmates for their competitions, and it's held up beautifully. Though importing swords into Japan is fraught with restrictions and legalities, this sword has actually been there three times for competitions, with the full knowledge of the authorities that it would be leaving the country afterward. As with most things in life, it's who you know. Now you're certainly going to see all that use on this katana as I go through the review, but keep in mind just how extensively it's been used. Let's take a look at the Saya, which was crafted by Mr. Tenel. The Saya on this sword is of a relatively simple one with a black gloss lacquer and then multiple koshirai parts. I do not remember the names. I believe this is a Semegahane don't remember this piece. This would probably be the Koiguchi. And a nice silk Sageo here. Now this Saya and sword have been used a lot, so it's pretty impressive that there's absolutely no rattle still. There's perfect retention. 
If I just give it just a little nudge, it comes right out. It does leave little bits of wood on the sword blade, I've noticed, but that's probably because it's been used so much. I want to show you that. If you look at the clay Gucci here, hopefully you're able to see, it's uh, pretty scuffed up. There's some clearly been some damage to it. Now the reason for that is because Steve loaned this katana out to a lot of members of his dojo for cutting. And, you know, some people may have misaligned the blade when putting it back in or pulled it out a bit poorly, causing little bits of damage to the wood. The fact that it has taken that little bit of damage and still fits perfectly is quite a testament to the original fit and finish. Moving on to the hilt and kosherai. Both the Fuchi and Kabuto Gane are made of iron, and they have a really nice, almost but not quite antique look to them, which helps them match the suba. Their designs are understated, and I believe intended to flow naturally with the katana, without catching the eye. There's no ledges between the kosherai and the silk ito, which is still very tight after years of use. If you look closely, you can see bits of the hishigami, carefully folded pieces of paper inserted under the ito to help shape it, sticking out. The diamonds are also a little uneven here and there. I assume both of these are, again, from the use this katana has seen. The samagawa is a full wrap with some large nodules near the kabuto gane on one side. It's developed a yellowish patina over the course of its life, which fits the overall look of the sword. The Manuki are a bow and arrow theme, and they're antiques made of shakado, which is an alloy of gold and copper, and they're highlighted with gold. The craftsmanship is really quite exquisite. The lines are crisp, and details easy to make out. Just beautiful work here. The one thing that I found interesting and non-traditional are the Makugi here. There's two of them, hopefully you can see them. And they are not the traditional susudake, or smoked bamboo. These are made of fiberglass, which Steve said is used, uh, was used on this for additional toughness. The other interesting thing is that they, there's two of them. A traditional Japanese sword would typically only have one, but again, I think for competition cutting, Steve wanted the extra durability of two. The antique Higo Tsuba is iron with gold highlights, and I'm not going to waste a lot of insufficient words here. It's beautiful, and I'll let it speak for itself in this video footage. The brass hibaki was made by Mr. Clark and features a raindrop pattern carved into the sides in a very attractive pattern. The fit to the blade is superb. You can easily tell that it was made specifically for this sword by how perfectly it fits. Moving on to the business end, the blade. As always, here are my measurements. Now, I'm not very proficient with the Japanese terms for measurements, but I can say it is a 29 inch Nagasa, which is the blade length, and it starts at 6 millimeters thick, evenly tapering down to 4.5 millimeters right at the Yakote, and then another very quick taper down to 3.5 millimeters just before the tip. This is a very thin blade for a katana, and it's done like that intentionally as a competition cutter or grass cutter. The hamon on the katana is rather subtle. It's not flashy by any means, as is normal for a saguha style hamon. There is a noticeably prominent line, one that reminds me of the lamination line you'll see on Kabuse katana. This is all monosteel L6, however. You'll probably notice a lot of micro scratches and wear on the blade. This is the result of being used against all those tatami mats. No matter how perfect the steel, if you use a sword to cut targets such as tatami, you're going to end up with scratches. And in the case of this sword, it's a lot of scratches caused by a lot of cuts. There's also some staining here and there from the tatami. Now all this could be cleaned up nicely by a new polish, but that's very expensive, especially considering that L6 is extremely abrasion resistant. It eats up the abrasives used to polish it, so that just adds to the cost. And frankly, there's something to be said for allowing the sword's history to show. 
looking down the length of the blade, the planes are all perfectly crafted. There's no rippling, no waviness to the lines, nothing. It's all straight and smooth and simply gorgeous. As expected for a $5,000 blade. Now let's take a look at some cutting footage. At first I was pretty intimidated by the idea of cutting with such an expensive sword. But Steve encouraged me to do so, and eventually I decided that with this sword's entire purpose being a cut competition cutter, it would be disrespectful to the sword not to put it to its intended use. So it cut very well, which is to be expected with such a well-constructed blade. The edge is still very, very sharp, even though it has been used a lot and the edge hasn't been touched up for quite some time. Sometimes when I am oiling this sword, you know, even just doing simple motions like this, it's cut the cloth a few times, which I've actually never had happen with any other sword. That's a testament to how sharp this blade is. All right, so let's talk handling. This katana has a good amount of authority in the cut. It's got a heft to it that I really didn't expect when I saw just how narrow the blade is. I thought it was going to be feel very light, but it's not. It, it does have that authority in the cut, which you want in a matte cutter, so it makes sense. It just kind of surprised me that it's uh, not quite as light as I was expecting. It's balanced at four and three quarters inches, right around there, which is a good place, in my opinion, for a katana. It's around where most of the katana I have experience with are balanced. But I feel like I'm in control of it at all times. And it just, it, it feels good in the hand. The silk Ito is extremely comfortable. The uh, ledges, like I said, there's no ledges on, on the transitions here, so I can move my hands around without any issue at all. That feels great. So it doesn't really feel, to me, a whole lot different than the other katana I've had. But I do have another katana here. This is a Shang sword. I, and let me put a disclaimer, I'm in no way con comparing these two swords in terms of value or construction or anything like that. I just wanted another katana that had somewhat similar stats to the Howard Clark one. But the Shang is, it's actually a little bit lighter overall, but it's definitely thicker and it's got a slightly, looks like it has, it's probably a 28 inch Nagasa rather than 29. So it's definitely uh, thicker and it's balanced just a little bit further out at five, exactly five inches. And the handle is, the suka is a little shorter at, I think it's like one inch shorter. So picking them up, they feel pretty similar, honestly, in terms of like forward point of balance, authority in the cut. Although I will say I am feeling a little bit of the uh, 
there's there's not really any ledges here, but it, this one's feeling a little bit more uncomfortable. I'm not sure why. But I pick this up and it's just, it feels natural to use this. It doesn't feel, it feels intuitive. That's, I guess, the best way to put it. You know, I'm not an expert in katana. I'm not an expert in any sword, but especially katana. But it just feels like I know what to do with this sword. It feels good. It doesn't feel point heavy. You know, I can move the point out quickly if I need to. Even though I don't think that's how katanas are really used that much. So something else I have a comparison of. This is going to look very odd, but this is a long sword that is very similar in terms of weight and point of balance to the Howard Clark. This is weighs less than an ounce difference. Point of balance is pretty much exactly at the same point place. And to me, this feels more uh, feels more nimble. That's probably just because I know long swords better. I just I feel like I hit my tree there. Uh, I just feel like I know exactly what to do with this, even more so than the katana. And, you know, like I said, I feel, I feel like the katana is absolutely intuitive. It's just, you know, I know long swords better. One-handed, let's see. You know, I've never really tried katana one-handed, but yeah, this works. I don't feel like I have exceptional control of it like I do two-handed, but that's probably just lack of experience. I almost never try anything one-handed with a katana. But overall, I think it feels good. It was a lot more fun to use when cutting than I expected. I wasn't sure that I was going to like cutting with it that much, partially because I was intimidated by the cost, but also just, I don't know, it, something about it when I first picked it up was like, I don't know about this sword. But then once I started using it, I get it. It's it's a lot of fun to use. This is normally where I talk bottom line, whether the sword is worth the price or not. I don't think that's particularly applicable here though, for a variety of reasons. First off, there's not really a specific price that can be put on the sword. It's too many specialized pieces put together. Secondly, it's just so far out of my wheelhouse that I don't think I could give an accurate answer. I'm much more focused on European swords, and while I like and can appreciate katana, it's not to the level where I feel like I can realistically evaluate the worth of such a high-end one. So yeah, I'm kind of punting the question here. But what I can tell you is that this sword is a lot of fun to use and handle, and I guess it's up to you if the extreme durability and toughness of a properly heat-treated L6 katana is worth the price. And that's going to bring this review to a close. Once again, Steve, thank you for allowing me to review your swords. It is extremely generous of you, and I appreciate it greatly. Uh, for everybody else, keep an eye out for a few more reviews of Steve's swords coming, including a dice show not all that dissimilar to this blade. But that's for another time. And until then, Alien to the Help.